Hey, welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today, we're joined by Alan Schroeder of Sonoda to discuss their instant settlement method for Bitcoin miners and energy providers. Thanks to Sonoda for joining, and thanks to the Digital Wildcatters for putting on a great show down in Houston, Texas at Empower. Before we get into the show, we want to thank Foreman Master Your Mining for being the sponsor of today's show. You'll hear more from Foreman Mining in just a moment. Also, we'd like to point you towards our Denver Bit Devs Havening Party on April 20th at the Independence Institute. It'll be uh, live talks, podcast recordings, vendors, and more April 20th at the Independence Institute. We'd love to see you there. You can find more details in today's show notes. Okay, on to the conversation. Okay, take two with Clean Spark. Hey, welcome back to the Mining Pod. Today we're joined by Alan Schroeder of Sonoda to discuss our instant settlement method for Bitcoin miners and energy providers. Thanks to Sonoda for joining and thanks to the Digital Wildcatters for putting on a great show down in Houston, Texas at Empower. We'd like to thank CleanSpark, America's Bitcoin miner, for making this show possible on the Coindesk Podcast Network. You will hear more from CleanSpark a little bit later in today's episode. Okay, before we get to the show, if you're in the Rocky Mountain region and want to join us at the Denver Bid Des Happening Party, be sure to check out our show notes to find a link to that event. It's on April 20th at the Independence Institute. We have live talks, podcast recordings, Bitcoin vendors, and more. So be sure to join. Okay, on to the show. Hey, listeners, let's talk about revolutionizing your mining operation with Foreman. This isn't your average management tool. It's an all-in-one solution for reducing costs and significantly boosting your revenue. Foreman brings a cutting-edge dashboard to your fingertips, empowering you with automated energy strategies. This means not only curtailing around real-time prices, but also strategically enhancing your profit margins through demand response. It's about leveraging energy efficiency to its fullest potential. With Foreman, you get a system that scales with your business, inventory management for assets, infrastructure integration, and business intelligence. Foreman elevates the cash flow and production of your entire operation. To see how Foreman can redefine define your mining operation standards, visit foreman.mn. With Foreman, you're not just managing a mining operation, you're setting a new standard in the industry. Want to mine Bitcoin? Gator Mining offers premium hosting with as low as one unit per client, 95% uptime guaranteed, no curtailment, 24-7 monitoring and maintenance, in-house certified repair center, clean and renewable energy, all at competitive market rates. Work with an individualized team to get hash rate flowing your way today. Gator Mining, pioneering trustworthy crypto hosting for optimal mining success. Contact Gator Mining today at gatormining.ca. Bitcoin miners, be prepared. Hash rate is moving upstream towards power plants and low value energy. Don't get cut off. Modernize and mobilize your Bitcoin mining fleet today with Upstream Data's high performance load centers. Plug in Upstream Data's hash hut and monetize surplus wind power reliably in the blistering heat of West Texas. Plumb in hash generators and safely convert natural gas into cash in the frigid winters of Northern Canada. Upstream offers high quality load centers that will help you mine Bitcoin safely and reliably in every application and climate. Mobilize today and start mining upstream at upstreamdata.com. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data dependent stories at theminermag.com. Alan, welcome to the Mining Pod. Thank you for having me, Will. Really appreciate you know your time, all the energy you're putting into this space. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, thanks for for making the effort um, down in Empower. So first thoughts? Amazing event. I mean, Digital Wildcatters just put together uh, a fantastic event at the music hall. Um, you can see the energy in the space, obviously, with the price where it's at, the having event looming. Um, the energy is there. Um, and the amount of people that showed up to collaborate, talk about ideas, work together, just amazing. Yeah. Okay. So what kind of uh, talks have you gone to so far? Because I actually didn't really go to any talks yesterday. I just like <laughs> talked to everybody, which is kind of the point of the conference, right? It's like B2B. But I always also feel bad that like I don't get to listen to any of the talks because obviously people put time and effort into them. Oh, 100%. Um, but and you're, you're there for meetings, really. Yeah. And and I'll throw myself under the bus right there with you. Um, you know, part of this event for me is to collaborate, collaborate one-on-one with a lot of individuals at different companies. And so that's where I spend a lot of my time and my focus at this event. Uh, if I'm very, if I'm lucky to catch a talk, you know, I try to stop. But uh, yesterday was uh, a little too busy for that, and really, that's a hat tip 
again, to Digital Wildcatters, the amount of folks that are here, uh, the level of the folks that are here, the quality of the people um, just made my day extremely busy. And it was very exciting. Yeah, definitely the same there. Uh, shout out to Digital Wildcatters for making the, the conference great. Um, yeah. Looking forward to next year also. Um, they have the Energy Tech Nights. They have one in Denver about uh, three months ago. Great, great time. Um, Okay, let's dig, let's dig into it. Yeah. We have to do the bio first. And we're also on Coindesk now, so I have a lot of new listeners. I think people who are typically listening to Mining Pod know about Sonoda at this point. They've probably heard you on different shows, but the broader audience definitely needs a, a classic big, uh, podcast bio. Yeah, sound good. Well, let me start with um, giving a, a quick background on Sonoda, and then I'll happy to jump into myself and, and the team. So, you know, at Sonoda, what we are doing is we are disrupting the 30-day billing cycle uh, for power purchase agreements um, for large industrial consumers and for hosting agreements as well. And so what that means is, you know, we are allowing for automated settlements that can settle at any time, but the typical frequency that we're seeing uh, settlements for our customers is daily. And so when you think about, you know, initially to get your listeners heads wrapped around that, what that impact is, is having is it's speeding up cash flow to the service providers, which is a value add. Um, it's also allowing the service providers to de-risk those contracts. So it's creating a new risk management tool uh, that's making Bitcoin miners, making hosting companies much more attractive to energy suppliers in the industry. And it's also helping to solve back office problems for hosting companies and these energy suppliers as well. So making that settlement process much more efficient and improving cash flow for those service providers. And so, you know, a little background on myself. Um, I'm the C uh, COO and co-founder of Sonoda. Uh, been in oil and gas for 16 years. Civil and environmental engineer. Spent a majority of that time focused on project development. So I've developed well over billions of dollars of um, gas midstream infrastructure uh, across the country, uh, supporting the, the shale boom. And along that way, had the uh, wonderful opportunity to meet Austin Mitchell, who was our CEO and, and uh, co-founder as well. Um, we've stayed friends for upwards of 12 to 13 years. And about four to five years ago, he was out in Denver for a wedding and we sat down and he's like, man, I got some ideas. And I was like, yeah, interesting. And as he started talking, I'm like, you are, you are speaking my tune. I've got very similar ideas as well. And so we just started collaborating and, and ideating around, you know, what, you know, Sonoda could be. Along the way, he brought in his older sister, Lisa Scott, who is our other co-founder, GC, um, and CAO. And between the three of us, if you, if you look at our experiences in the energy industry, we all have an energy background to some extent. We've covered everything from front office, back office, commercial, BD, strategy. Um, so we've seen the full life cycle of energy um, and had a good understanding of everything going on. So then as we started talking, there's a, you know, a lot of problems that, that you can solve in energy. But when you think about energy, energy is the biggest credit system that exists in the world. Energy is flowing every single day, and consumers don't have to pay for that energy upwards of 30 to 60, 90 days. So there's massive credit being that exists out there, and that credit, that flow is not free. It's costly, and that cost comes in various ways. And so what we identified is here's an opportunity to flush out that cost and flush out that efficiency. And oh, by the way, especially in the Bitcoin mining industry, we can use the Lightning Network to help solve that. And I definitely want to double click on that as, yeah. we, as we progress, as we progress the conversation. Um, but I do want to go back and, and just, you know, highlight the team again um, on top of, you know, the incredible co-founders, um, you know, Austin and Lisa. We also have an amazing tech team that has a diverse background from economics and products and energy and security um, that's really helped to make our product extremely robust. 
on top of that, we've aligned ourselves with a, you know key advisors. I've got one sitting over here, Rob Barkley, who's been in the energy space for 40 years, pioneered deregulation. Um, so we've aligned ourselves with some of the greatest people in the industry to help build this product with the focus that we are going to solve a massive problem. And we are doing it focused on the biggest energy companies in the country. Let's go back to oil and gas and your background on that. Yeah. So, where did you get your start doing oil and gas, and what yeah. did the progression of your use of sixteen year career? Yeah, sixteen year career. Um, so, I'm a civil environmental engineer, graduated from the University of Cincinnati. Um, got a call from uh, Shell Oil. Hey, you want to come down and interview? And actually, you know, as we were talking, I don't know if it was actually this building or the building next door. Did my my interview with Shell? <laughs> uh, got an offer. Uh, so I moved down to Houston, uh, worked at, out at the Ship Channel, Deer Park Refinery, doing environmental projects, uh, eventually shifted over to Williams Natural Gas, Transco Tower out in the Galleria here in Houston, also doing environmental projects. At that time, that's when the Appalachia shale boom was, was happening up in Northeast um, PA, Southwest PA. So I begged and bartered to get myself up there because I wanted to be a part of that boom. And that move is what really transformed my career. Um, and I'll say that because at the time, the growth up there was intense. The amount of infrastructure getting developed and built was intense, and they didn't have the workforce available to handle it. So it was almost like being at a startup company, except you had a Fortune 300 backing behind you. And so there were no processes in place. Uh, there was a lot to learn, a lot of problems to solve. And what that allowed me to do is touch every aspect of project development. Ultimately, Williams built a project development team, and I was one of the first employees of that team to help develop all these complex projects over time. And so I want to hone in on that a little bit. When you think, when you think about developing a, a complex physical project, there's a lot that goes into it. So as a gas midstream provider, you're servicing a, a gas producer. So you're getting their input on what they need as they are looking to, you know, grow their production. So you take that, you design, you know, what does that next piece of infrastructure look like? But then you have to go and get buy-in and input from all these individual st stakeholders. So you got operational input, you've got technical input, you've got project management input for cost and scheduling. You got to get environmental input for uh, permitting and impacts to the company. Then, you, oh, by the way, you got to take that to the financial team and you got to put all that in a financial model to figure out the commercial viability of the project. How are you going to price it? And then you have to layer on what does the future look like of that asset, of the company? Do you need to plan for additional expansion or other customers? And how do you layer in that strategy into that project? So, you know, during that time, my mom, you know, not fully understanding the industry, she asked me one day, she's like, well, what do you do? Like, I, I don't understand what you do. And I'll shout say, out moms. Yeah. For yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I was trying to come up with an analogy to explain to her like what I did. And so the best way, way I could figure it out was, if you remember as a kid, you had these connect the dot books where you connect the dots and it creates a picture. And I said, hey, mom, I'm the one with the pencil that connects all the dots. Yeah. You have all these individual people that are really good at their jobs, yeah. but they know their dot. They don't always know how everything connects to create a project that can then go to FID and get fully funded. And so I'm pulling in all these inputs, understanding how they all fit together to get that project off the ground. And so when you think about then, you know, and that's in the physical space and now I'm in the tech space. And so I think about, you know, my value add to, you know, a new tech growth company is I'm doing that process today with all those inputs from customers, our tech team, you know, Lisa, Austin, but the velocity of it is just much faster. Before it was project oriented that could take months. Now it's basically day by day. You're taking those inputs in real time and you're making decisions to try to grow your product, work with customers. Um, so, you know, over that life cycle, as I've gone through oil and gas, developed physical projects, that's definitely helped me on the tech side. Um, and so just to kind of finish off the story, um, you know, developed about a billion dollars worth of projects up in Pennsylvania. Um, Williams at the time bought a company called Access Midstream. 
um, out of Oklahoma City. I moved to Oklahoma City to help in start integrating some of those team members into Williams. And then at the time, I got a call from some former colleagues that got private equity backed. And they said, hey, Alan, we're looking to build this company up. Can you come help us? And I said, sure. So I moved to Denver um, and helped them identify an asset that we ended up buying up in Wyoming. We as part of the management team, grew that asset and then eventually sold it to a public company. Um, and then that was my last stop before jumping on board with with Austin and starting uh, Sonoda. How do you like Denver versus Houston versus Ohio? Oh, ho, ho, ho. don't put There's me. There's a right answer here. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't put me in that spot, Will. Yeah. Um, I think it's like for me, and this is, you know, an individual opinion. It's all about timing of life. So in Houston, I was, it was right post-college. I was living right over here in Midtown. And I will say one of the most fun, fun times of my life, you know, being young, single, great time. Um, Denver, you know, pre-kids, I'm married, have kids, by the way. So pre-kids with my fiance, then wife at the time, awesome. Explore the mountains, got to do a lot of fun things. Um, but now with kids... Being back in Ohio, where I'm originally from, being close to a lot of friends and family that still live there, amazing. And, you know, I was one that never thought I would move back to Ohio. I was one that I'm getting out of Ohio and I'm never going back. And that's changed and I'm very happy it's changed and I enjoy it. Yeah, there's a sneaky uh, Bitcoin Ohio sneaky. Yeah, and that's just... You know, that's a whole nother rabbit hole that I hope you pursue in your podcast that Ohio is got immense potential. It's to me going to be a, a big state for Bitcoin mining. Um, but on top of it, it's becoming a big tech state. Yeah. And with all of the universities that there, all the young folks that are, um, you know, getting into uh, having more of an entrepreneurial hat in the tech scene, I, I think you're going to see a big Bitcoin presence, a big technology presence around the Bitcoin space in Ohio. Need ASIC help? Check out Bitamine, one of Bitmain's certified repair shops located in Washington State with satellite offices in Colorado, Oklahoma, and Texas. PSUs, hashboards, immersion setups, in and out of warranty repair, Bitamine has you covered. Want to train your technicians? Bring Bitamine to your site for hands-on training in the art of ASIC repair, complete with Bitmain AMTC certification. Contact Bitamine today at dan at vmasic.com. Again, that's dan at vmasic.com. When you think of ASIC repair, think Vitamine. Not to dwell in Ohio too much. This is a Colorado themed show. Uh, should, <laughs> is it easy to do like business development in Ohio because there's so much Bitcoin mining stuff going on? Like you guys are able to like kind of work with relationships very quickly in New York and LA and Houston, obviously those big areas, like easily do get a lot of work done in Ohio. Does that have like that density yet? Um, what I, what I'd say is that from our product where we focus, ERCOT is still, Texas is still the number one, right? Where to get business done. You know, ERCOT is the model for everything happening in the power space. Um, PJM, which is the ISO behind within Ohio and Ohio itself, we view as a close second. Right. You know, they, they are coming behind doing a lot of similar things that ERCOT is doing, but they're not quite there yet. And which is great because it allows us to build our product up, continue our relationships. And as Ohio starts building up, which we're seeing, we're going to be right there to capitalize and, and support the power industry, support Bitcoin miners. So. Okay, I've heard a lot about PJM and Ohio market, so I definitely wanted to ask about that. Let's go back to something you were saying earlier, which is you transition from energy to tech. Yeah. And we will get this to note, I promise you. Yeah. I, I want to ask about that because I think a lot of Bitcoin miners find themselves in that position where they're in the oil and gas industry or the energy industry for 10, 15, 20 years. Now they're in the tech and they're like the tech bro or in the vest. What was that transition like for you? Did you enjoy it? And do you like moving over? Yeah, I would say it definitely took me some time to adjust. Um, just from the fact that being in physical infrastructure, I knew the full ins and outs, right? I could sit in a meeting with a customer and I could explain, you know, how the technology of the physical infrastructure works, how the operations work. I could walk through every detail all the way to commercial and contracts. In tech, it took me a little time because I don't know code. Yeah. I'm not a coder. That's why we've got our engineering team to help build that. Um, so it took me some time to get used to, you know, asking a lot of questions, understanding how they work, um, getting comfortable with that. And then just the sheer 
speed and velocity at which you have to work um, from it. But when you really think about it, it just makes your day-to-day that much more exciting, right? Super exciting. Um, The amount of problems that you have to solve and the problems you're solving real time are just amazing. And I I think it's, it's intellectually an enhancement for folks that want to do that because physical infrastructure is a little bit slower. Gotcha. Okay, let's go into Sonoda now and, and talk about the product a little bit more. So you guys have this offering for Bitcoin miners right. to handle the credit side of the market. Mm-hmm. Let's break it down like a little bit more granularly, and I'll just hand it over to you to do that. Yeah, one hundred percent. So when you think about back to energy being maybe the biggest credit market on earth, and back to that float that exists is not not free now how the cost of that flow is impacted for every energy consumer within the ecosystem is very different. So let's focus, though, on Bitcoin miners, large industrial consumers um, that a lot of times are not viewed as very credit worthy in the industry. So to cover that float, when you think about, hey, they are consuming large amounts of power, stacking up a lot of accounts receivable risk to that energy supplier. The energy supplier says, man, I can't take that risk. My credit team over here is not going to do that. And they have a whole credit team that's assessing every single customer they have. And they're layering on all of that credit risk across their portfolio to understand how they manage their business. Um, So when they look at a Bitcoin miner, they're understanding how does it fit in their portfolio? How do I cover my accounts receivable risk? Because I'm supplying you power every single day. And so there are a couple tools, legacy tools that exist to cover that accounts receivable risk, which is essentially a cost burden to a Bitcoin miner. It's collateral, prepayments, or letters of credit. And so when you think about what is happening with that, let's just take collateral for example. When a Bitcoin miner goes to build a Bitcoin mine and secure a power purchase agreement, when they're building that mine, they're outlaying a bunch of capital to build that mine. Now the power company or power supplier or REP in this case is saying, hey, to secure this contract, I also need X of millions of dollars sitting in a bank account to make sure that you're going to pay me. So that is additional working capital on top of the project capital that the Bitcoin miner had to outlay. Yeah. And that working capital is not earning additional value to the Bitcoin miner. So these are the legacy risk management tools that power suppliers had. But it didn't solve the underlying problem, which is really, I'm supplying you power every day, but you're not paying me until 45, 60 days later. So just the simple idea of let's solve that. We can do that. Like the data is there, everything is there, the infrastructure is there to do that. So what we've done is when you think about the end of the billing cycle where an invoice is generated by the supplier, the invoice is sent, invoice is reviewed and verified, and then funds are actually sent from the miner to the supplier. We do that full process yeah. automated every single day. And those funds are actually flowing from the Bitcoin miner into the custodial hands of the energy supplier, thus de-risking that contract and speeding up the cash flow to, to the energy supplier. So now they've got a whole nother risk management tool they can use to serve the Bitcoin mining industry. And oh, by the way, now Bitcoin miners have much more working capital in their pockets to either manage their business, grow their business, however they want to approach using that capital versus putting it in a lockbox and not being able to touch it for one, two, five, 10 years, whatever that contract looks like. How often do Bitcoin miners get denied for not being able to have like credit worthiness or capital collateral? I mean, it's Probably not no data around that, but like, is it kind of a common story where it's like, yeah, we can't really work with you because of. Well, here, here's here's how I'll I'll answer that question. It's not really about getting denied. It's more about so ERCOT yeah. in Ohio. These are deregulated markets where any registered REP retail energy provider, you know, that meets that that meets um, that ability to to serve that load could bid on that Bitcoin miner. So when a Bitcoin miner wants to spin up a, call it a 10 megawatt site, they want as many REPs that come bid on their project as possible to secure the best power purchase agreement they can. And what I'll say is 
there's a handful of REPs that could bid on that. But what I understanding is happening and talking to REPs themselves, they're only getting a couple of bids. So it's not that they're getting denied. It's just that the supply that's out there that could exist to serve that load is being very cautious. So there's a lot of REPs that are saying, maybe I'd add one Bitcoin miner to my book, but I'm going to pass yeah. on bidding on a lot of these projects. So it's pretty price inefficient because you don't have more exactly. bids in an auction for one 100%. of these Bitcoin mines. Okay. 100%. Okay. And so by differentiating the payment structure, you guys are allowing more REPs to come in and bid on a Bitcoin mine project. Yep. Yep. So when you think about uh, these large energy suppliers, you think about the departments, right? So they have an origination team. Their job is to go win business, go bring business into, into the book, provide value to the company. Now, when they go to bid on a piece of business and they structure a deal, the biggest department they got to get past is their credit and risk teams. They got to get past that department. And if they can't, they can't actually pursue that deal. Yeah. So what we are doing is we are offering a tool that allows the, the credit risk team to look at that energy consumer differently and say, okay, instead of them paying us later, they're actually speeding up our cash flow. Yeah. So they're de-risking that. And not only is that de-risking them, but wow, when you look at our treasury, now we've got this mix of energy consumers where Historically, it was all paying us 30, 60, 90 days later. Now I've got a mix of some consumers paying me daily. So this change in cash flow management for the energy supplier too, there's some advantages around that, around their own credit and their own cash flow management that they have as well. Um, so it's almost like improving their portfolio mm -hmm. and making Bitcoin miners somewhat attractive of like, man, I would love to have some daily payers. If you just think about cash flow, you don't think about who it is on the other side, like, wow, I would love to have some of these large consumers paying me daily because it improves my business. So maybe I should go get Bitcoin miners as part of my portfolio just to help my own cash flow management. Yeah. That makes sense. Like from a business perspective, it's yeah. nice to get paid on time. Um, and then you have the ability to go deploy that cash somewhere else or right. keep on the balance sheet. For Bitcoin, why do you need Bitcoin at the center of this? Like what? How okay, just a steel man or a straw man here. Why can't we just use Venmo for something like that? <laughs> well, let, let me start by saying um, we do offer a USD to USD solution, um, and we're actually iterating on that solution and, and, and improving it um, yeah. along the way. But it is not the superior solution. Yeah. A Bitcoin miner paying in Bitcoin is the superior solution. And so let's double click on, let's, let's walk through that. Um, maybe a good analogy is, you know, when you think about what we're doing, we're turning a power meter into a point of sale, similar to when you go to check out after purchasing a TV at Target. We're turning that meter into a point of sale, verifying the invoice, money moves. Now, when you think about the flow of funds behind a point of sale with your credit card and what's happening, you have the issuing bank behind the card. Basically, when you tap that card as saying, hey, Target, I approve this. Don't worry. I'm going to send you funds for that $400 to your bank in two to three days. Right? And that's the reason why Target says, hey, Will, you can leave. Take that TV, even though you didn't actually give me money. And then you turn around and then you pay the credit card company 30 days later. Super inefficient, right? Now, when you think about how we're doing it on Lightning Network. And so in this case, uh, where a Bitcoin miner is paying in, in, in uh, Bitcoin, we spin up a Lightning node for them and our software acts as an agent around that node um, and takes those settlement terms and moves the Bitcoin immediately upon verification of that contract such that when, you know, similar to when you tap that card at Target, you are telling them, I approve this transaction, I'm willing to pay for it on our platform. When, when the consumer side says, I agree with this invoice, I'm willing to pay for it on Lightning Network, that movement of Bitcoin is atomic. Yeah. It is there immediately. 
And for our, our REPs or our suppliers, we do immediately convert that Bitcoin into USD if that's their preference, which today is yeah. all their preference. <laughs> One day we hope that is, yeah. you know, that is not. So when you, when you compare it to the normal point of sale process that takes days for funds to move, yeah. funds are moving within seconds on Snowdus. So not only are you securing that risk from the energy supplier moving funds every single day, but it's happening in seconds. Yeah. So you know immediately that that energy consumer paid you and it's in the custodial hands of the supplier, yeah. which then creates a whole brand new type of customer and a whole new situational awareness yeah. for that energy supplier, right? They're, they're in a whole new realm of like before, like I know my energy consumer is consuming energy, but I don't fully, like I don't have this business sense on if they're going to pay me. But when you see payments happening every single day and you see it showing up in your account immediately upon an invoice creation, it just creates this whole new look and feel um, between a relationship of the consumer and the supplier. Is it possible to get like more granular with it where it's like, you know, per usage of electricity, you're sending over sats? Is that something that is like possible or even like useful? Because most businesses are, you know, kind of check out at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, sorry, did go a little de deeper on that yeah, question. So like, it's kind of like streaming music and you can pay for like per song, per stream. Oh. Like, can you do the same thing with energy? Yes. So we could technically settle any period. Now, when you, when you think about the granularity of the data that exists within the energy industry, yeah. e every single location is a little bit different, but with an ERCOT, you could get down to five minutes. So you, we could technically do five minute calculations and settle every five minutes. And the question is now more to human nature, yeah. right? And the consumption of those settlements. So yeah, we could be sending sats over every five minutes, yeah. money's building up, but the value add between a daily settlement versus five minute settlement on this marginal, right? So, uh, from a human consumption standpoint, for you know, daily settlement has been kind of that sweet spot today. Yeah. Now, however, there are additional products within the risk management space, within margin management, other ideas in which quicker movement of sats back and forth between an energy supplier and energy consumer to secure risk, mark to market risk, there's value in that. Um, but that, that's a high level topic for, for yeah. another time. It feels like a financialization question where like maybe in the future there's some sort of like derivatives market around how fast you can move money and energy together. Um, but yeah, we don't need to go down that, yeah. that rabbit hole. The thing I'm kind of picking up on is like, Bitcoin as like a cash instrument or a bear instrument is superior to credit for Bitcoin miners. Where has been the pushback on this like thesis? So like it's very intuitive for me. Like I'd rather have Bitcoin, but for like these oil and gas folk or anyone who's just like more traditional, mm -hmm. where do they look at this and kind of like push back on and be like, eh, we kind of like the net ninety or net thirty payment system. <laughs> yeah. Um, so generally, where a supplier uh, um, offers daily settlement, we have seen almost no pushback, right? In the sense that, hey, they're going to get more working capital in their pockets. It just makes too much value sense. Now, where we do get some pushback is how, as a Bitcoin miner, do I pay? Hence, we have a USD to USD solution, and we're going to continue to improve that USD to USD solution. You know, so when you think about Bitcoin um, and its life cycle and where it's going, if everyone uh, believes that it's going to become a money, there's various stages it's got to get through. Yeah. But I think we can all agree that right now Bitcoin is a very clear store of value. Yeah. The ETFs have fully cemented that around the world. And so it is a store of value. So today, when you think of Bitcoin, and if you think of it just as a store of value, you've got a decision to make as someone that holds that commodity, yeah. right? How often do I want to liquidate that? What is the value of that to me versus other ways to pay my OPEX that, that I have that exist? Um, now, we believe that two things, that paying in Bitcoin one makes you a less risky customer to the power supplier. And that's going to make them happier. Yeah. Now, second, 
if you believe that Bitcoin needs to become a money within the world economy, yeah. right? It then the next stage of Bitcoin is becoming a medium of exchange. Yeah. So if you think about what Bitcoin miners can do, mm -hmm. if they pay all their power in Bitcoin, they're going to turn Bitcoin into a medium of exchange. Now, Bitcoin has already started to become a bit of a medium of exchange when you think about cross-border payments, right? You think about some of the big companies, Strike and others that are doing that, that is, un that is unlocking value and solving a problem. Yeah. And they're doing it, you know, more on the retail, you know, smaller payment side. We are introducing a way of medium of exchange at large scale. Yeah. And what that's going to do is increase the liquidity within the Lightning Network, yeah. demand more Bitcoin to be posted on the Lightning Network. And thus, it's going to drive the, we believe it's going to help drive the value of Bitcoin up over time. And so if Bitcoin miners in the space are believers on the future of what Bitcoin can do for humanity to become a money, yeah. that next step of medium exchanges is, is important. Yeah. And so by paying paying those power bills in Bitcoin long term will have a major impact to the value of Bitcoin and thus their treasuries over time. Now, I'm a big fan of that. I want more people paying and like spending in Bitcoin. Um, let's talk about like the practical stuff. If I was a Bitcoin miner or conversely, if I was like an energy provider, what would be the steps to be like onboarded to something like Sonoda? Yeah, 100%. Um, so, you know, First, I want to kind of back up and, and talk about the mindset that, that we had. Um, being in the energy industry, all of us for, you know, the co-founders for 15 to 16 years, we knew we had to build an enterprise grade product. Um, and so that's the approach that we've taken all the way from how we've architected the product, um, the data that's behind the product, the reporting structures that we have um, for all of our customers and the compliance that we're taking. You know, we're SOC 2, Type 2 certified, we're getting our SOC 1. All of these are very important things for large companies when they go to use a SaaS product. Yeah. And when you think about what we're doing, money is exchanging hands and that's serious business. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had all the rigor behind us that everyone feels very comfortable about what's happening yeah. and there's an audit trail that's behind it. So all that to say, we put an immense work behind it. Now for the onboarding process for an energy supplier, it really is probably call it less than a week's process to get them physically onboarded yeah. to the platform. One time onboarding process, get them on from there. We're digitizing every single contract that they want to bring to the platform. So that digitization process of taking those settlement terms and putting on the platform, we do all that work. All we need is the inputs. And again, typically it takes us a couple of days to knock that out. Then when you think about the energy consumer getting on our platform, probably takes them to onboard 15 minutes or less. Super simple for the Bitcoin mining process. And so there is some white glove touch. I mean, yeah. it's not completely, the onboarding process isn't just completely autonomous, right? There is some communication needed on both sides of, of the fence to get these parties on board. Yeah. But the beauty about that is once it's complete and once that digital contract is in place, everything after that is completely autonomous. You never have to log in to Snowda's dashboard if you don't want to. You never have to touch anything. The invoicing, the flow of funds, they, it just happens. Yeah. It's automatic. So it creates this long-term uh, efficiency for all the parties involved, um, which is fantastic. You know, I was talking to one of the service providers that are on our platform uh, just last week, and we we're talking, and, and he's like, man, you know, I actually haven't logged in to your <laughs> dashboard in like two months. He, yeah. And I was, and he's like, yeah, I just, you know, occasionally check my bank account and I see that I'm getting paid from, from my Bitcoin miner funds are showing up. It's like, I don't even think about it. And, and I just laughed and I'm like, that is a great statement, but I don't know. What, wouldn't mind you logging in and, and touching, <laughs> touching the product, you, you know, once, once or twice here and there, but yeah. that's the beauty of it. That's yeah. the beauty of it. Like it is, there is a little bit of white glove touch lifts to get onboarded. Yeah. which when you think about doing an enterprise grade software, moving money, you want that, right? But afterwards, it's easy. You just sit back and you watch it work. 
It feels like a pretty big compliment, like just background software that's doing its thing. What is that? Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It kind of seems like what you would want. What have you enjoyed about being in that scene? It's different than oil and gas. Oh, man. It, What's in the? I want to hear the struggles too, because that's kind of my favorite conversation, honestly. <laughs> well, yeah. Let's start with the good, right? Um, you know, in in oil and gas, there wasn't a lot of novel things going on. I mean, midstream infrastructure. Everyone, you you pull up their websites, they all got a new fancy word to try to explain what they're doing. And it's like, come on, we're all doing the same thing. We're putting pipes in the ground, compressor stations together, gas plants. It's all the same yeah. thing. Um, and so since there really is no intellectual property involved too, like people are very closed off about what's going on in their business. So you don't get a lot of good open exchanges in that oil and gas world, um, which is kind of frustrating. So what blew my mind moving over into the, the Bitcoin technology space and Bitcoin in general is how open people are to talking about their business, what they're working on, their problems, uh, where they're going. Now, they're not going to yeah. tell everything, yeah. but the openness between where I was at in oil and gas to Bitcoin, Bitcoin technology is just, it, it's night and day. Yeah. And so what that does to me is that that fosters tighter relationships, yeah. right? And it's a small community, right? When you really think about it, there's a lot of people involved, but it's really just, you know, a small community. And, you know, when folks are working together, it benefits everyone and it creates a bit of a rising tide and you, you want to see everyone succeed because, because those bonds that, that get forged over having those conversations versus more of this just natural competitive space in oil and gas. And you're kind of, <laughs> you, you know, you're kind of doing a dance trying to, trying to hide your business. But, um, so that's been awesome. Right. Um, now the challenges to me that I've seen is the velocity in how quickly things change, yeah. right? So oil and gas, you're working on a project for months and then you're trying to implement that project after it gets funded, you know, for 12, you know, 12 months, 24 months. Um, Bitcoin mining is fascinating in, in the fact that, you know, you can move machines in and out pretty quick, right? You could secure a deal one day and all of a sudden decide they don't want to go build there. They're going to go build somewhere else. And then you think about the wildcatting that is essentially going on in the space of all these developers out there trying to secure load studies and locations and trying to sell them off. Um, there's a lot of just constant movement. So trying to constantly stay up to speed on you know, all the projects that exist in the space, what's changing, what people's pain points are. It's moving so fast and changing day to day. Yeah. It just adds additional complexity in the space. Um, so it's, it's definitely a challenge. And, you know, some of that is, saw this in, in oil and gas too, in the early shale, shale boom, where um, because you can flip assets so quick, you get some folks that want to just make a buck. So they're in here and that added um, stress on the system of getting additional load studies that may never get used, right? Doesn't fully benefit, yeah. right? The Bitcoin mining space. And it can create a bit of a smear uh, to, of Bitcoin miners within the industry, right? So if you're out in West Texas, oil and gas needs power too. Other industries need power too. And if you got all these developers locking up load studies, it can create a burden for them that when they want to go expand their gas plant, yeah. well, shoot, I can't get load to do that. And you don't know if that load study that got locked in that took that power away is ever going to get developed by the Bitcoin mining space. So, you know, it's not perfect. And that's part of a market system, that imperfection. Um, and eventually that'll, that'll get more efficient over time. I want to go back to what you said earlier in the the good part of Bitcoin, which is everyone kind of working together. Yeah. There is like a lot of IP disputes around software and you guys are kind of in the mix of the Bitcoin software stack. How do you think about 
working within like those sort of issues. I mean, I, I'm not referring to anything with you guys, so I'm not aware of anything, but there's certainly a lot with mining management software and I've seen stuff with like pools. So as like a software provider, how do you guys work within that part of the ecosystem where there is a, like a lot of IP and there is a lot of people who don't want to work together? Yeah. Um, I, I'll say, I'll say this, you know, Sonoda's approach is that we know what we're good at. We know what we've developed and we are laser focused, which means, you know, we do rely on third parties, both hardware and software to complement our platform to effectuate everything going on. And we're perfectly fine with that. And so by knowing that, like, if we had all the time and all the resources, could we just go build out the full stack hardware, software, and touch everything and try to bully people out? Yeah, but what's the value of that, right? So we're, we're, we're focused on what we're good at, yeah. know what our IP is and what we're doing, and then connecting with the folks that know what their role is, what they're good at. And so if you layer all these companies on, you can create amazing products. Yeah. And you know, if you try to bully your way in and do everything and push folks out, I think you also limit the growth yeah. because you can't focus on everything, right? So if you focus on what you're good at, especially in a, in a new age of technology around Bitcoin, if you allow everybody to focus on what they're good at and you work together, you can develop things a lot faster. Yeah. So that's that, that's our approach. Love it. Okay, that's a good place to talk about like what you guys are doing next, or what's like the forward-looking guidance. <laughs> oh man, oh man. Um, <laughs> tee you up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, look, there's there's a lot a lot to that. Yeah. Um, but when you think about where Snowd is at today, um, we view ourselves as a as a bit of a risk management tool. Mm-hmm. And the power space needs additional real-time risk management tools across the industry and for various products that they have. So we definitely see the opportunity to continue to build on our base platform to support other products or other focuses of the power industry and the energy industry to create the most dynamic risk management platform that ever existed. So that's just kind of one thought that I'll throw out there um, about Sonoda. Um, And then, you know, we also see where some of our underlying IP, there's potential to take that to other industries. And I won't I won't go too deep into that, but we definitely see that aspect. It is not where we are spending our time today. But we're very well aware that that exists and maybe there's even a potential to take that ip and license it out and allow someone who is focused in that to go run and build um so definitely uh, some great opportunities over time um to what just the base of of what we built And, and ultimately you know when you shift it back to energy we want the energy industry to become the most efficient market that it can be and when it becomes the most efficient market that it can be, you'll hear, you know, you you go look at every Austin Mitchell podcast that exists out there, which I encourage you all t- to do um, as well. But he loves to talk about abundant energy. Yeah. And we are all in our, our shop, big believers of abundant energy. And to create abundant energy, part of that process is creating efficient markets. And efficient markets are going to help drive abundant energy. Um, and that's going to help humanity because energy is the backbone of modern day society. We can't do anything without consuming energy in our daily lives. No, definitely. Okay, where can people find Sonoda and find yourself? Yeah, 100%. So you can go to our website, sonoda.io. Um, there you can reach out to us uh, as well. I mean, you can hit me up on LinkedIn, Alan Schroeder. Um, you know, I don't really get into to the Twitter game. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I just... Just, yeah, yeah. I just don't have a lot of uh, time on my hands hands for that. But you can find Austin out there um, on Twitter. I actually don't remember his handle off the top of my head. But, um, you know, it's definitely LinkedIn uh, through our website. And, uh, you know, if you hit me up, I'm more than willing to hand out my cell phone uh, through those avenues as well and, and get on a conversation with, with anyone out there in the space. Even if you just 
even if you want to learn more. Um, I've had plenty of conversations. People have reached out in the space and they just want to understand more about what Sonoda is and what our vision is. Happy to educate. And then that's the beauty of this space. Like, enjoy the conversation. So uh, feel free to reach out. Happy to talk. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining the Mining Pod. Appreciate yeah. your time. Awesome. Appreciate it, Will. Uh, doing great things in the space. So happy for you. Awesome.